everyone. Um, welcome to day five of the GEO Work Plan Symposium. We have a little special treat right now. Um, if everybody who is online um, and live streaming uh, can unmute, we have some special birthday wishes we would like to give to Jana Gaborgian. So I'm opening it up to everybody who's um, in blue jeans right now. So let's say happy birthday. Happy birthday! Have a lovely day. This okay, is gonna, this is going to be saved for everyone in Geo to watch forever and ever and ever, Yana. <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, we can't see Yana's reaction, but we're hoping that she is very happy with uh, with our, our wishes. So thank you to everybody who joined early on the live stream. Um, and now we're going to uh, go ahead and, and get down to business. Um, so this is the monitor and essential variables session. And Rick, can you go ahead and um, show the presentation? So welcome everybody to the last day of the GEO Virtual Symposium 2020. Um, my thanks to all of who have stayed with the program throughout the entire week. We begin this last day with the monitoring essential variables. Next slide, please. So your facilitators for this session are myself, Carrie Sawyer, Thierry Ranchon, and Andrea Siquiera. All three of us have been a part of one or more of the previous sessions, so I will forego the formalities of reading our short bios to allow more time for questions. And this is a shameless plug for all to prepare your questions and submit them via Slido. Next. Our six presenters will provide four presentations, which will be followed by the virtual panel session. Simon Eggleston is Senior Scientific Officer of the Global Climate Observing System, GCOS, based in Geneva. Leticia Navarro is the Executive Secretary of the Geobiodiversity Observation Network, GeoBon, based at the German Center for Integrative Biodiversity Research, IDIV. Gabriel Canonico is Biology Lead in Marine Biodiversity Observation Network, MBON Manager. She works for the U.S. National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA. Frank Mueller-Karger is a professor at the University of South Florida and is co-chair of MBON and I must admit, has the nicest background in his bio picture, Imenvius. Anthony Lemon is Vice Director of the Institute for Environmental Sciences at the University of Geneva. Anyuan Mosso is a physicist who works on geospatial interoperability for the Center for Ecological Research and Forestry, Forestry Applications, CREAF, which interestingly is a geo-associate agency and I know that he's proud of that. Next slide, please. So essential variables, EVs as a concept, has been increasingly used in Earth observation communities to identify those variables that correspond to high impact on Earth system, high feasibility, and relative low cost of implementation. EVs should be a priority for monitoring. This session, aims to take a horizontal perspective on the good practices and lessons learned on how three sets of EVs are developed, accepted, and used by their respective communities. The concept of essential variables began with a clear mandate to the Global Climate Observing System, GCOS, around 1997, when key variables describing biosphere, hydrosphere, and cryosphere based on measurement practicality and the priority for climate were identified by the international terrestrial community. I recommend all refer to the concept of essential climate variables in support of climate research applications and policy paper that was written by Bujinski et al. in 2014. The expression essential climate variables was first introduced in GCOS in 2003, spanning the atmospheric, oceanic, and terrestrial domains, and this term was taken up by both scientific and policy communities. And the ECBs have proven so successful that many communities are identifying their own communities with essential variables. And this session attempts 
to provide some context and perspective on how to develop EVs, what are the lessons learned, and how can other communities benefit from the work of those before them while keeping the number of frameworks to a level that, was, that does not dilute what is truly an essential variable. Looking at the GEO work program, there are almost 10 essential variables in addition to ECVs. And unfortunately, it is not possible to comprehensively address all of them during this session. So we have just focused on three, essential climate variables, essential biodiversity variables, and essential ocean variables. And these will be followed by a presentation on the GEO essential variables community activity. Some questions to consider during the presentation. Is it possible to have too many frameworks and community-specific essential X variables to a point where it becomes challenging to identify what is essential? And is it possible to extend existing frameworks rather than to create new essential variables? Next slide, please. Lastly, I would like to remind you all of the all too familiar directions on how to interact with the presenter. Please submit questions via Slido using the hashtag GEO and selecting session 12. If you do not submit questions, I'm inclined to tell you that the presenters will be asked to entertain us until our 90 minute session is concluded. There will be no early stop for the break. So, without further ado, we are ready for our first presentation which will be from Simon on GCOS and the essential climate variables. Hello, uh, I'm Simon Eggleston and I'm currently working for the uh, Global Climate Observing System GCOS. Um, my main focus is on uh, the terrestrial climate observations, things like cryosphere, hydrology, and the biosphere. Over the years, I've had uh, considerable experience looking at fluxes of greenhouse gases. I used to work with the IPCC, producing guidelines on how to estimate emissions and removals of greenhouse gases, and then worked with the Global Forest Observations Initiative, looking at fluxes of greenhouse gases from forests. GCOS uh, is based at WMO, and there have been a number of uh, recent uh, changes. We have a new chair of the steering committee, uh, Professor Han Dolman from the Netherlands, who's, uh, who's taken over uh, from Professor Stephen Briggs. We also have a new director, Anthony Ray. Um, the GCOS secretariat will remain based in the WMO, but will actually be closer to the observation parts of WMO, which is probably a good thing. So WMO is continuing its commitment to hosting GCOS and together with the other co-sponsors is looking at reviewing the governance of GCOS, uh, aiming to make proposals to improve the relationship between GCOS and the co-sponsors primarily. And we're working on a number of uh, different things. We're continuing to working on the ECV requirements, looking at the status report and an implementation plan. We're working on regional activities, workshops, and national support to help people observe these ECVs. Uh, we're planning on how to make GCOS more effective, increase its impact. And as we're thinking about the ECVs, we're thinking more about adaptation impacts, extremes, and the global climate cycles. So G the ECV are an essential part of uh, GCOS uh, and come in many ways from its mandate, which was to provide comprehensive information on the total climate system, covering uh, all the different parts of it, and meeting the needs of quite a wide range of users from science and climate range detection to policy, both global and national, and research in the, uh, modeling and prediction. So the first step for GCOS was to identify what needs to be observed and to produce requirements for these observations. And starting in 1992, this, this process uh, developed and led to the, uh, the essential climate variables as a concept to actually crystallize what the needs of climate observations. What is an ECV? Well, eventually it was um, laid down and uh, crystallized and a definition was produced. An essential climate variable 
DCV is a physical, chemical, or biological variable or group of linked variables that critically contributes to the characterization of the Earth's climate. The ECVs themselves uh, are a group of um, parameters within those all those climate system variables that are possible. And there is there a subset where the observations are feasible and cost effective, but also they're relevant to the users of that information. Essentially, the ECV datasets provide the empirical evidence needed to understand and predict the evolution of climate, guide mitigation and adaptation measures. Their production was founded on climate science and climate data, and also the observational capacity and infrastructure. There's no point in defining an ECV if there's no way it will be measured. And to support the ECVs, we produced a range of guidance, which include the actual user requirements themselves, which uh, the observations try and meet. Also, observing principles and standards. These were approved by the UNFCCC and WMO and IOC, and they're the, they're the standards and principles that the climate observations aim to meet. We also produced additional guidelines for data set uh, preparation to support the use of the ECV. An important step in this, beyond the science, understanding the science observation, is identifying the users to understand what will be relevant. And in the past, GCOS has tended to concentrate more on the broader things of climate science and climate, global climate policy, and also providing support nationally and globally. Uh, as we're moving forward, we're also looking more at the impacts of climate change and responses to climate change. So those identifying who the users and what the needs for these climate observations are enables us to identify what are sensible ECVs. This is a list of the ECV, which were produced in 2016 in the uh, GCOS implementation plan and have been approved by the UNFCCC in parts of WMO. They're divided into atmospheric, oceanic and terrestrial parts, which are looked after by those respective panels. But in some extent, this, that distinction is rather is a bit arbitrary and made for practical considerations of which groups actually make the observations. So, for example, though we have the cryosphere and terrestrial, we also have sea ice under oceans. Each of these ECVs may have one or more sub-parameters as well. So we call them ECV products because to define some of them, you need to know more than just one thing. The ECVs, we try and aim for them to be consistent across a number of issues. The climate system itself, and what we're trying to understand, composes of another component, for the water and carbon cycles, there's the energy balance and the biosphere. The, if to understand each of these, we need more than one ECV. We have a number of ECVs that contribute to that. And we've set long-term understandings for the overall under, uh, measurement and monitoring of these cycles. So the ECV requirements must be consistent within a cycle. We don't want something to have enormous accuracy in one part of, say, the carbon cycle and low accuracy in another. Also, a lot of the ECVs belong to more than one cycle. So, for example, evaporation is water and energy. So the ECVs must also be consistent between the cycles. It's also important to remember that a lot of the ECVs are also measured for other purposes. Um, a lot of the atmospheric ones are measured for numerical weather prediction. We, we want, don't want to duplicate activities in other, in other places. We need to make sure that the requirements and the needs that we identify fit into these other monitoring activities. We developed a process in 2016 to produce the ECVs that started with a GCOS reviewing the status of the existing system and then the GCOS panels consulted with the various observation communities to refine the, the requirements for each ECV. They then made a proposal in terms of accuracy, the resolution and so forth, which was then publicly reviewed and formed part of the implementation plan that was then published and presented to the various stakeholders. Also, in order to actually make these requirements practical, and then should see that they match. We need to monitor how well these are observed and how well the data sets are produced match against the requirements. We need to follow up actions identified in the implementation plan to, to improve the networks. We need to work with stakeholders 
to improve the uptake of ECVs. Um, uh, stakeholders such as the European Space Agency, CCI, Climate Change Initiative, which is working on producing satellite records of a number of ECVs, the joint COS CGMS working group on climate, which are planning a lot of satellite measurements of the ECVs. And finally, it's important to ensure that QA, QC is implemented uh, for all the ECV records. The process we're following now for the uh, update that will be published in 2022 is very similar, except that we've increased the amount of review. We've already had a public ongoing consultation, uh, and the panels are now considering that uh, before there'll be a second public review, uh, and then the data will be incorporated into the implementation plan as before. So we're having greater public involvement, which we feel is quite essential in developing the ECVs. We're allowing more time for the panels and the experts to consider the requirements. There'll be greater involvement of stakeholders. And we're also asking for more detailed information and definitions of the ECVs to make it clear of what exactly has been asked. And finally, there'll be more specific consideration of different users, for example, related to adaptation and impacts. The table on the left shows the information that we collected and published for each ECV in 2016. So the ECV itself, there's any sub variables that were needed. For example, here, lake area, lake temperature, and lake color. Uh, the frequency, how often each measurement needs to be made, the resolution that was needed, the uncertainty, the stability. And stability is an important parameter for climate change where we're trying to detect often relatively small changes over time. So we need a measurement long time term series that are accurate uh, over those times to detect the change. And finally, any references and standards. This will evolve for 2022. It's very similar, the sort of information we're asking for, except we're asking for an additional element of timeliness. This is the well, sometimes called latency. It's the time between the measurement before it becomes publicly available. And we're also going to ask for more than one number. So there'll be a threshold value, something that has to be achieved for the data to be useful, a goal, which is where any improvement beyond that doesn't really lead to any uh, benefit. And then possibly in between those values, a number of uh, values that are sometimes called breakthrough values, where there's specific benefits for specific users. So we're going to give ranges rather than individual values, which is what we did before. A final thought about ECVs, uh, about data storage and access. Good data stewardship is essential. This is particularly true for ECVs, where we're looking at long time series. The longer, the better. But it's true for even for records of short duration. So they need good metadata so the data can be found, addressed, and its provenance and limitations known. The QAQC needs to be recorded and documented so people understand the quality of the data. There should be uncertainty estimates with the data. People need to understand that as that provides limits on how it's used. And the data should be freely and openly available. There's not much point in collecting this data for climate, and they're not allowing people to use it. For satellite records, this is often largely the case, especially uh, when it's being coordinated through the working group on climate. And there are a lot of, uh, I think about 490 records available through the ECV inventory, which lists all this information and metadata and the location of the records where they can be downloaded. They include both the climate data records themselves and what are called fundamental climate data records, which is particularly important for satellite records. And these are essentially the original measurements from the satellites, often radiances and similar. And that means that if they're stored as well, then if improved methods of deriving the parameters we're interested in for climate are derived in the future they can be reprocessed to produce an updated climate data record. So to summarize, ECV are physical, chemical, or biological variables, or groups of variables, linked variables, that critically contribute to the characterization of the Earth's climate. 
The ECV are defined after quite a large public consultation. They're not independent. They should be consistent across the climate cycles and consider other uses. They need to be adopted internationally. They're supported, ECV are supported by the UNFCCC, the WMO, IFC and others. And I think this is an important point that gives a much more um, support and uh, credibility to the numbers. It's important to help stakeholders use the requirements and involve them in the development of the requirements so that uh, they have a stake in the process. We need to make sure the principles and guidelines are also available so people understand what is needed in terms of climate records and what are the minimum requirements. Data stewardship is important, free and open access is needed. And we've been defining the process. Uh, the process of defining an ECV has been improved and refined uh, with more asking for more detail clearer definitions, more public and stakeholder involvement, and a range of values rather than a single number. So, thank you very much. I hope that's uh, provided some overview of the ECV and how we produce them in GCOS. Thank you. Thank you, Simon, for setting the stage with your presentation on essential uh, climate variables, which we can all agree <clears throat> has set the standard for essential variables. We will now hear from Leticia on monitoring global biodiversity change with essential biodiversity variables, which were proposed 10 years after the introduction of ECV. Um, Leticia is the Executive Secretary of the Geobiodiversity Observation Network, Geobon. We are ready for the presentation. So good morning, afternoon, or evening, depending on where you are. Um, I will be presenting on biodiversity change and EBVs, or essential biodiversity variables. So I'm Leticia Navarro. I'm presenting from Leipzig in Germany. I am a conservation biologist by training, but most importantly, I'm the executive secretary of Geobank the Group on Earth Observations Biodiversity Observation Network. And today I'll be talking about the development of essential variables to monitor global biodiversity change or essential biodiversity variables. But first, to put things into context, I will probably not surprise you by saying that we're undergoing a biodiversity crisis. This has been documented largely in the media and in the scientific literature. And in fact, the degree of ecosystem degradation and the observed decreases in populations of wild species have led some scientists to question if we have reached a sixth mass is extinction. The good news, so to speak, is that at the same time, we're also witnessing some strong commitments for biodiversity. And this is exemplified with the many multilateral environmental agreements that have been signed in the past decades, such as the UNCBD, the UN Convention on Biological Diversity, or more recently, the establishment of IPES, the Intergovernmental Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services. The establishment of those multilateral environmental agreements is oftentimes accompanied by the design of sets of targets and goals at the global and national level that are meant to guide effective biodiversity conservation. And concretely, what this means is that if countries want to be able to assess whether they're on track to achieve those targets, they also need access to timely and relevant biodiversity data. But the problem is that this is much easier said than done. One reason for that is that we're still facing important knowledge gaps when it comes to biodiversity. There's, import there's important spatial gaps as you can see uh, on this map on the left-hand side. This map shows you the locations or the points that are used to calculate the Living Planet Index, which is a widely used indicator of the state of biodiversity. And you can see that while the distribution of those points is pretty good globally, it is still suboptimal. There's still a lot of areas where we don't have information on the state of biodiversity, at least based on the points that are used to calculate this indicator. 
There's also important temporal gaps, and it's quite difficult for us, for instance, to get our hands on good time series on biodiversity that would predate the 1970s or 1960s. And on top of that, there's also important taxonomic gaps. This is what you can see here on this map on the right-hand side that shows you the distribution of sampling sites for soil biodiversity. And again, you can see that the distribution of those points is not optimal. So in this context, when you have on the one hand a demand for more data and information, and on the other hand all the knowledge gaps that I just mentioned, you'll understand why there's been over the years several calls for an improvement in the acquisition, coordination, and delivery of biodiversity observations. And this was meant to serve several users, not just the scientific community, but also decision and policy makers. So this is how the Group on Earth Observations Biodiversity Observation Network, or GEOBON, was established 12 years ago in 2008. The long-term vision of GEOBON is to establish a global coordinated biodiversity observation network that can contribute to effective management policies for biodiversity and ecosystem services. And to support GEOBON's missions and vision, Five years after its establishment, the framework for the essential biodiversity variables was proposed in 2013. We define those essential biodiversity variables, or EBVs, as a minimum set of measurements that are complementary to one another and that can capture major dimensions of biodiversity change. In other words, this means that EBVs are biological and policy relevant. They have to be sensitive to change. Their biological state variables. They have to be generalizable across realms to the best extent possible, and this means marine, freshwater, and terrestrial. They also have to be scalable and, of course, feasible. And those EBVs are organized around six classes that cover all levels of organizational biodiversity, the genetic composition, species population, species traits, community composition, ecosystem structure, and ecosystem function. Another way to look at those EBVs is to see them as the level of integration between primary observations, for instance, remote sensing or in-situ observations, and higher level indicators of biodiversity change. And the blueprint of the development of EBVs is what I'll refer to as the EBVs workflows, and is generally organized around several steps, the collection of primary observations, the standardization of primary observations, then the integration of data and mobile-based estimation, and finally the publication of datasets following the GeoBond data guidelines. So within our network, uh, GeoBond members are now working on defining the essential biodiversity variables or EBVs within each class and describing the workflows to produce the EBV data products. In particular, progress was made in recent years to conceptualize essential biodiversity variables for species traits and for species populations. And you can see here two examples of workflows to produce those EBVs. So I will not get into details, of course, but I invite you to check those two publications if you're curious about the process of defining EBVs and the workflows for different dimensions of biodiversity. One critical point is that the EBV datasets then needs to be published ensuring the FAIR principles. So they have to be findable, accessible, interoperable, and reproducible. And it also became clear quite quickly that we needed, we needed a minimum information standard for the EBVs if we wanted to facilitate the reporting, the harmonization, and the streaming of the EBVs. So our team at the GeoBond Secretariat is now developing the new version of the EBV data portal in order to make EBV data sets available. And this portal is going to be composed of an EBV catalog for indexing and a spatial browser for visualization and analysis or summary of information. And we're finalizing the new version of this portal that should be ready uh, in a couple of weeks. Another important milestone for this year and in general in the, in the development of the EBVs is a project that we started uh, a little less than a year ago and that we call the EBV 2020 initiative. And the idea behind this project was to ask what are the EBV data products that are already available or that could be ready by the summer of 2020 and that could be mobilized in the EBV data portal. 
So this initiative was organized around uh, two workshops where we brought together, um, I would say, a little over 60 members of the networks that are working on uh, the development of individual EBV data products. And we started by identifying, with the help of the participants, a little over 70 candidate EBV data sets. And we then narrowed it down uh, to a list of a little over 50 data sets uh, that would match the definition of an EBV and the criteria that I listed uh, a little earlier. So now we're in the process of following up with the data developers so that we can mobilize those data sets. And in particular, uh, we are now prioritizing the data sets based on their policy relevance, which is a perfect segue into my next point. Because as I mentioned to you at the beginning of this presentation, in the case of GeoBond, one of the key end user uh, is the UN Convention on Biological Diversity, or the CBT. And in general, the policy relevance of the outputs of GeoBond is something that is very important to us. So early on, when the EBV framework was first proposed, there was an effort that was made to assess to which extent the EBVs could be useful and relevant to track progress towards the achievement of the IG targets of the CBD. The IG targets is a set of 20 targets for biodiversity conservation for 2020. And indeed, those EBVs were relevant. The EBVs are relevant to track progress towards uh, most of the IG targets. More concretely, uh, GeoBond and members have been developing a suite of uh, global biodiversity change indicators that are um, more specifically designed to track progress towards five of these IT targets. And those indicators that are EBV-based have been formally endorsed by the CBD. And some of these indicators have also been used in the global assessment of EPES that was uh, published last year in, uh, in uh, the summer of uh, 2019. At the moment, this year, uh, the CBD and the parties of the CBDs are now discussing the post-2020 global biodiversity framework. And GeoBond is, of course, engaging also in this progress, including by identifying the relevance of EBVs and EBV-derived indicators for this post-2020 biodiversity framework. Similarly, we can also ask if and how the EBVs can be useful to track progress towards the achievement of the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals. And of course, EBVs would be relevant for SDG 14, Life Below Water, and SDG 15, Life on Land, but not only. EBVs could also be relevant to track progress towards the achievement of SDG 2, Zero Hunger, or SDG 3, for instance, on health. So now I wanted to go back to the uh, EBV framework, and you'll acknowledge that there's a rather important part of the equation that I have left out until now, which is the collection of the primary observations. And of course, without this collection efforts, there would be no EBV and no indicators of biodiversity change. This is why one of the core activity of GeoBond, aside from the development of the EBVs, is also the development of the bonds or biodiversity observation networks. And the mission of those bonds is to contribute to the collection and analysis of harmonized biodiversity observations and to develop integrated and interoperable biodiversity monitoring programs. Within GeoBonds, those bonds are organized at different levels. So we have three thematic bonds, the marine bond, the freshwater bond, and the soil bond. We have three national bonds in China, France, and Colombia. And we have three regional bonds in the Asia-Pacific region, in the Arctic, and in the Americas. And of course, these are not the only uh, biodiversity monitoring system out there, but those are the ones that have gone uh, through the formal process of endorsement for bonds that GeoBond has put in place. Now, I wanted to conclude this presentation with some thoughts on the operationalization of the development of the EBVs, looking at the structure of the GeoBond network. This structure was adopted in 2016 at the beginning of the second phase of implementation of GeoBond. And this structure really reflects our focus around the development of the EBVs and the development of the bonds. So what's interesting here is that each of the EBV classes, each of the six classes, has a dedicated working group. We also have a working group focusing on ecosystem services. And one thing I haven't mentioned until now is that this working group is working on the conceptualization 
of the framework for the essential ecosystem services variable or EESVs. And within our structure, as you can see, we also have room, of course, for the development of the biodiversity observation networks that are focusing on the collection of uh, biodiversity observations, among other things. We also have a working group here, that the Bond Development Working Group, that is acting as a bridge between, between the two. And on top of that, we also chose to establish uh, some task forces that are focusing on cross-cutting issues relevant to all working groups and bonds, for instance, remote sensing, policy support, and data management. And I think that having this structure has really helped us to push forward the development of the essential biodiversity variables. Because having this structure, there's a distribution of responsibilities and expertise around the development of the different products or the different EBV classes, but we also have mechanisms that support interactions between the working groups focusing on EBVs, but also with the biodiversity observatories. Now, if you want to know more about what we do and how we do it, I invite you to join our Open Science Conference and All Hands meeting, which will be fully virtual, as you can imagine, uh, and that will be organized in a couple of weeks at the beginning of July. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you, Letitia. So Letitia introduced us to the thematic biodiversity observation networks, or BONDS, that contribute to the collection and analysis of biodiversity observations. We will now hear a joint presentation from Gabrielle, the Marine Bond Manager and member of the Integrated Ocean Observing System, U.S. IUS at NOAA, and Frank, a biological oceanographer and professor at the University of South Florida and co-chair of NBON, and they will be speaking on essential ocean variables for sustained observations of marine biodiversity and ecosystems. We are Ready for the next presentation. Hello, everybody. Uh, we're here to talk to you about the essential ocean variables for sustained observations of marine biodiversity and ecosystems. This is going to be a joint presentation by Gabriel Canonico and by myself on behalf of the Global Ocean Observing System and also the Marine Biodiversity Observation Network. I am Frank Miller Carger. I'm an oceanographer at the University of South Florida in St. Petersburg, Florida, and I'm one of the co-chairs of the MBON, the Marine Biodiversity Observation Network. And I am Gabrielle Canonico. I am part of the U.S. Integrated Ocean Observing System program. I'm also co-chair of the Global Ocean Observing System Biology and Ecosystem Panel and the coordinator of the U.S. Marine Biodiversity Observation Network. There are very, very large investments in ocean observing systems around the world, and yet we don't really have a good way to understand how life in the sea is changing. And one of the things that we would like to understand is ex exactly how life is changing, uh, because we ourselves depend so much on marine life. So one of the objectives of having this partnership between different observing groups is to obtain good and timely information about marine biodiversity and understand how these ecosystems are changing because with that, uh, changes are occurring that affect our own uh, economy and our health. This is what we can get today in terms of a global picture. Satellites give us a really good, almost daily picture of how patterns are changing in terms of temperature, winds, one of the things that we can relate to biology is the color of the ocean, basically by looking at the chlorophyll distribution. So that's an index of biomass. But there, there's not very much information on biodiversity itself. So what kind of fish, what kind of plankton, what kind of shrimp or other types of organisms are in the ocean and how that's changing. That is something that we would like to uh, understand. But the reality is that the in situ databases that we have, especially the open uh, databases like the Ocean Biodiversity Information System, uh, are not very complete. Here, for example, is a representation of the number of records that we have in OBIS over the past 100 plus years. And in the surface ocean, basically in the upper 20 meters of the ocean, we find that the, most of the ocean doesn't even have any observations. So 
uh, there are very few places around coastal zones and especially in the industrialized areas where we have a little bit more data. But if we look at these graphics on the right-hand side, uh, the top graphic shows that there's a, a decrease in the information that we have that goes into these databases over the past five to 10 years. And so if we want to understand change, we would like to update these databases on a routine basis. And with the same thing happens when we look at, uh, at, at space. So if we go from north from the Arctic to Antarctica, we can see that the polar zones have a lot less data than the tropical or temperate areas. And if we go deeper into the ocean, which is not shown in, to this, in this graph, uh, the information also decreases. So we need to, the whole point of trying to organize these observing systems is to address the, the need for timely and uh, space information. So that's where we want to develop a community of practice uh, and to try to network observing systems around the world. There's a number of, of regional efforts. A lot of them are focused on physics and biogeochemistry, and we would like to uh, engage those observing systems in measuring biology, because in the end, the reason that a lot of the physical and chemical measurements are made is to try to understand how these changes are affecting life. And so we want to do this in coastal zones, in exclusive economic zones, and out to the high seas, uh, not only to understand where you need to have marine protected areas, but also to monitor the effectiveness of anything that we're trying to do to conserve these ecosystem services. Eventually, all of this is important because we need to uh, manage our own behavior or understand what we need to do to understand resilience of these ecosystems and how those ecosystems support our blue economy. So these uh, observing systems eventually provide data in data sets and that we would like to filter either by taxonomy or some other metric of diversity in space and in time to make maps. And these maps can change in time to tell us something about the abundance and the trends in different types of organisms over time. The, the way that we want to organize this is through uh, what we're calling essential variables. And, there are essential climate variables, for example, to track how climate is changing. So you measure a few very key parameters in, a, in an efficient and cost-effective way. Now we have defined essential ocean variables, which, what, which is what Gabrielle is going to talk about. And from the Marine Biodiversity Observation Network side, we're working the umbrella of GEOBON, the GEO Biodiversity Observation Network, to define essential biodiversity variables. And these are all linked. These are not completely independent frameworks. They are completely interlinked. So, for example, here we have the, on the right-hand side, we have uh, the group on Earth observations where GEOBON, Blue Planet, and the Marine Biodiversity Observation Network live, and we're defining the essential biodiversity variables. And on the other side, under the UNESCO side and the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission, is the Global Ocean Observing System and uh, organizations like OBIS and the uh, Ocean Teacher uh, Global Academy and so on. Those are the systems that we need to network together to provide data integration and products for a number, a very large number of users that also provide data to the same system. The essential biodiversity variables that are being defined under GEOBON uh, effectively is this uh, grayed out circle that has six different classes of uh, uh, what we call EBVs. The simplest or the, the, the for example, we have a genetic composition. Uh, we also want to know the populations that are based uh, on the numbers uh, on, on species itself and community composition of these populations. Also ecosystem structure ecosystem function, and uh, species traits. So these are the six essential biodiversity variables that would be used to develop indicators, for example, to go and inform the conventional biological diversity, uh, Aichi targets, or whatever comes next uh, after 2020, and also the sustainable development goals. I'm gonna pass it on to Gabrielle to talk about the essential ocean variables. Thank you, Frank. 
This is a complicated graph, but I'll talk through it for a moment, a few moments. Um, the goose biology and ecosystem essential ocean variables were identified through extensive review of societal needs as identified by more than 20 international conventions and multilateral agreements that are relevant for marine life. The review also looked at the state of ocean observations measured by a number of observing programs and the impact, feasibility, and scalability of variables that emerged from that analysis and how they contribute to addressing societal and scientific questions. The EOVs were selected based on their relevance in helping solve science questions and address societal needs both. The need for the information um, to manage marine resources and the feasibility of taking the measurements globally, looking at cost, available technologies, and also human resources to take the observations. So the EOVs that you see listed on the left of the graph represent functional groups that met these criteria, as well as a set of variables representing biogenic habitat state. These EOVs, again, grew from that process of exploring the needs of the users listed on the right of this chart and leverage the capabilities of the partners that are also listed here. So you can see this is, there are very many number of players in this process. The slide can be viewed in two directions. So from the right to the left, the EOVs were born from a process that identified the needs and capabilities of users and partners. Now that we've identified this set of EOVs, we're working to determine how to implement them. That's viewing the graph from the left to the right and to provide the information through those variables back to the users that need the information. So each EOV has a champion. Those are listed also in the chart. Some of these are evolving over time, but in some cases there are more than one champion for each variable. These are experts who are leading the development of specification sheets that help to guide implementation of each EOV. There's ongoing work on a number of these variables, and I'm just going to give a few examples. We recognize the importance of macroalgae as habitat, a nutrient source, even for mariculture, yet data to assess macroalgae at a global scale are collected using different methods in different places, and they're not fully aggregated. The situation is similar for sea plants, including seagrasses and mangroves. And for each of these EOVs, the expert teams have met in workshops to identify data sources, review methods, and plan next steps towards global monitoring and mapping efforts that are standardized and, again, global in coverage being a critical uh, priority. There are other EOVs that are in discussion and in implementation. For the coral EOV, that team has identified a plan towards a common global strategy for coral reef monitoring and reporting that includes adoption of the EOV and EBV frameworks to identify priority variables for understanding and reporting on health of coral reefs, but also for mechanisms to improve delivery of those variables and the data. Another emerging EOV is Ocean Sound, which was discussed during a workshop last year and is recognized as a cross-cutting topic that could support all biological EOVs. An expert team has recently submitted a score proposal focused on visual census methods for nearshore benthic fish communities, and discussions have begun around deep ocean invertebrates as a first step in engaging the deep ocean community on biology and ecosystem EOVs. All of that to say that each one of the EOVs has a component of biodiversity that we have to map because all of life, including our own, depends on marine biodiversity. And because of this, we've taken steps and taken time to map the EOVs to the EBVs, including ecosystem function, genetic composition, habitat structure, and others. Again, this is a complicated chart, but we wanted to demonstrate the mapping activity and looking across different networks, different sets of variables, and how they interact. We've also taken steps over the past years to engage with existing ocean observing community partners to build on infrastructure that's in place and processes that, that already are working 
These include the GUS regional alliances as well as other GUS components where ship-based, moored, or other observations are coordinated. Ultimately, the need for biodiversity information is to address social and economic questions and our reliance on living marine resources for nutrition, recreation, subsistence, and many other reasons. So we really do need an understanding of biodiversity status and trends and therefore we need the biodiversity time series, but, but significant gaps exist in our ability and um, resources to collect this information. Common methods for biodiversity science and observation, wider distribution of low cost technologies and expanded capacity along all the steps in the value chain are critical to addressing these challenges. Given to, to shared best practices is a really important step. This includes expanding the community of practice around marine biodiversity observations and science that considers user requirements for information generated from those efforts, ensures capacity observers of observers as well as users, and emphasizes the importance of interoperability and integration across disciplines to explain biodiversity, share information, and ultimately address critical social and economic needs. A number of groups have a role in this. Frank mentioned early in the talk how many of our efforts are interlinked. This um, graphic on this slide provides an example of some of those partnerships where, for example, the GOOS Biology and Ecosystem Panel and GOOS more broadly is very focused on requirements for sustained observations. MBON is very focused on the coordination of those observations and the partners that are taking them and using them, and also the promotion of best practices and, and capacity building. And OVIS is clearly very engaged in open data sharing and data integration efforts. But there are others listed here, and this is not a complete set, who have a need for the information, again, to support global biodiversity assessments, sustainable development goals, national needs for information on status and trends, that sort of thing. So this is an open invitation to join the community of practice. Um, again, not interested in recreating the wheel, but very much interested in leveraging our collective efforts that are already in place, filling gaps where we need to, and doing a better and more consistent job of, of understanding biodiversity status and trends globally. Thank you. Thank you, Gabrielle and Frank. So we have heard from three communities on the development and endorsement of their identified essential variables. So rounding out our session is a presentation from Anthony and Juan on the GEO Essential Variables Community Activity, whose goal it is to link data sources to policy indicators through a generalization of essential variables across many societal benefit areas. Anthony is an ecologist and professor at the University of Geneva and Joan is a physicist and comes to us from CREAF. Das hier sind Tom und Marco beim Land. So we're having a little technical glitch. It's Friday. Almost Saturday. Hey everyone, then. it's a pleasure here to present to this very special uh, Geo Virtual Symposium uh, our work on monitoring essential variables and we entitled Towards Integrated Essential Variables for Sustainability. It's the work done in the GeoEssential project and its uh, essential variable community activity, GeoEV. So the presenters are 
two today. It's myself, Anthony Lehman. I'm an ecologist. I've been working uh, in um, with GIS and, and modeling uh, a lot with biodiversity, but also with water and other topics. And I've been coordinating different projects, presently coordinating the geoessential project focusing on essential variables workflow. Together with me is Johan Masso, who is a physicist from Barcelona and has also been very active uh, in GIS, remote sensing, and uh, spatial data infrastructure in many years. You all know him probably, and uh, has been coordinating also different uh, European projects, among which the uh, Connecting Geo project, which was also focusing on essential variables. So the project we'll be uh, presenting uh, a lot is GeoEssential. It's part of the European ERA Planet uh, Network for Observing uh, the Planet, which has four different sub-projects. But we'll be essentially uh, presenting GeoEssential. So as you all know, being in this session, probably uh, different domains have already worked a lot on the concept of essential variables. Uh, some of them, like the climatologists, have proposed the concept and, uh, and uh, been defined them to, to define the, the climate system uh, with its uh, atmosphere, of course, but also its land and ocean parts. And uh, others, like the biodiversity community, also picked up on this concept and started defining uh, the concept of essential biodiversity variables to try to relate raw information observation to policy needs uh, in terms of indicators, for instance, and uh, in the middle somewhere uh, where are the needs of defining essential biodiversity variables. We know that other uh, fields have started to work also on this, such as water, uh, and uh, and others are really starting now, like agriculture, energy, urban, extractive, like I will sh present uh, later on. And we also know that uh, some authors, like Reyers et al., uh, have proposed ways of, of uh, looking at essential variables to address uh, the SDGs and showing in, in this graph how essential variables can reduce the number of, of necessary observation to keep track and monitor to uh, address and inform uh, policy indicators uh, such as uh, SDGs. Like I mentioned, uh, I would like to review some of the recent efforts uh, such as uh, the one uh, proposed by GeoGLAM, the Global uh, Agriculture Monitoring uh, System within GEO and uh, which are reviewing or, or proposing, started a working group to look at essential agriculture variables. And uh, with the same idea, of, uh, I think, as for biodiversity, linking the raw data to uh, policy needs. And uh, though the work is, is, uh, is ongoing here. Uh, recently also, we have seen the emergence of essential renewable energy variables with uh, Ronchin et al publication and previous work. And uh, again, it's, it's the, um, here the definition of, of selecting the necessary uh, indicators to address uh, essential renewable energy. Uh, in the list that they propose, we see that uh, several of the uh, proposed variables are connected uh, essentially to uh, existing essential variables in the climate domain, but not all. Uh, among recent efforts also, I think it's important to mention the development of essential societal variables because we cannot define our uh, complex uh, um, socio-ecological system uh, if we concentrate only on the natural part. So in order to complete the picture of, of the socio-ecological systems, we need to define the atmosphere, the the, the, the land masses, the oceans, uh, the biosphere, and uh, uh, also in the land and oceans, but also to define the human system in, that, that will interact with all these uh, the different um, subsystems. So uh, essential societal variables have been proposed by Erlich et al. and uh, presenting, for instance, variables on, on, on global built up areas and population as a, a way to address uh, several uh, policy needs, such as the HDG, SDGs, of course, but also the Paris Agreement, the Sendai framework, and the urban agenda, 
um, which uh, are all priorities also for, for GEO. So we can also uh, review existing uh, initiatives, uh, such as the one on, uh, on climate of, of GCOS, the, the, the first initiative on essential variables. And here in this paper, proposing our special issue on essential variable, uh, Spinoza et al. has been looking at uh, how much of the data uh, is available to inform about the, the different uh, essential climate variable. And they have proposed a way of reviewing the accessibility and usability of, uh, of the different sources of data. And we can see, for instance, that in terms of accessibility, uh, most of the data has a direct access, but not all of it, which is good. But it doesn't necessarily have a direct access uh, computer to computer yet. It's, it's sometimes it's, it has, it's an FTP site with a password and so on, and the things can still be improved uh, in accessing the, the useful uh, data. So taking uh, the stock of what has been done, uh, we proposed uh, three years ago uh, a new European project called GeoEssential. Uh, the concept of which is in this figure. We were thinking that it was interesting and important to um, help the different communities within geos, uh, societal benefit areas, such uh, biodiversity and climate, of course, they have started the work and are already pretty advanced. Water is ongoing, energy we see uh, has started, the soil and agriculture was working on it, and we, were, we had also activities in the extractive domains. We thought all these pyramids of information could uh, be uh, using uh, this concept of essential variables, linking the raw data to uh, policy needs uh, to address, as it is a European project, the European policy needs, but also the global uh, policy agenda. And without redefining necessarily new indicators for the SDGs, uh, the SDGs could uh, reuse some of the in indicators being defined in these uh, global policy agendas. So in our project, we are not only looking at the access to the data, but also in uh, transforming these data into these indicators as uh, online workflows. And in order to do that, we've been using the virtual laboratory technology developed by a CNR in Italy uh, and which is directly connected to the geo infrastructure the geos platform uh, and will it has a way to define what is a what is a, a workflow uh, with its ontologies its uh, its uh, process and uh, different pro products and its data needs that are accessible to through the geos platform it will compute the workflow and then uh, send back the product to the GEOS platform. So one example of such a workflow uh, we developed in addressing the SDG uh, 15.3.1 proportion of land that is degraded over uh, total land area, um, and uh, which is uh, related to land degradation. And we defined the workflow using different uh, de possible data sources at different uh, scales, from the Swiss national scales to the global scales, using the trend earth model implemented in, in different uh, processing platforms, such as the VLAB, but also Amazon uh, clouds and so on. And then building the uh, indicators uh, and, and presenting the output um, on, on, on uh, special data infrastructure and dashboards. So once you have defined a conceptual workflow, you still have to, to then uh, decide which uh, model and data sources uh, you, you will be using, and that's defining the ontology of your workflow, which we did uh, in this example, and then resulting in uh, outputs uh, European at the European or global scales, which has been uh, now published or is published on our, 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 our dashboard here, where you can uh, look at aggregate, aggregated uh, uh, values of, of this uh, indicator per country or, or administrative units or at the global scale. Another example of such a, a workflow that we defined in, in our project is uh, at national level in Ukraine, 
uh, looking more at agricultural um, needs uh, and uh, transforming uh, uh, Landsat and Sentinel uh, data into uh, useful SDG indicators here, forest area as a proportion of total land area or proportion of land that is degraded over total area as, as previously, or proportion of agricultural area under productive and sustainable agriculture. Um, so in, in our project also, we, I mentioned, we, we are looking also at another activity, soci socioeconomical activities, which is the extractive, the mines, uh, which is very important, has a big uh, potential footprint on, on uh, other uh, socioeconomical and environmental uh, issues. And, um, and we, the, the group here, have proposed uh, a, a list of essential uh, extractive variables uh, which uh, allow to, to address uh, the impact of this activity on, on different um, issues. And it's also relating to different SDG uh, indicators. Also in, uh, in uh, ERA Planet, in con combination between the SMURB Urban Project and Geocentral, uh, Patia Seto have proposed uh, a new list of ur essential urban variables, uh, and um, making also the link with different SDGs and, uh, and building up on the previous work of Erlich uh, et al. So I give the floor now to Johan Masso uh, to uh, continue uh, the presentation. Yeah, because in Geo, in Geo Essential, what we did is continue these graphs uh, that we started in Connecting Geo to do a gap analysis of in situ observations and uh, observation networks. And we wanted to connect the, the SDGs uh, with the SDG indicators and uh, with the mainly the, the in situ networks that are collecting uh, data around. Uh, and uh, we classified the, the SDG indicators in, in four categories. I will explain that better in the next slide. Next. Uh, we classified in using this uh, dra driving pressure state impact and response uh, model uh, or framework. Uh, this is a framework that comes from the biodiversity arena where you have driving forces uh, that uh, are pressuring the environment. This changes the state of the environment. It has some kind of effect uh, that also generates an impact uh, that transitions into a socioeconomical impact that's actually the response of the natural system into us. That creates a reaction uh, on us and uh, the circle repeats itself. So we that it could be interesting to apply this uh, circle and this framework into the essential variable indicators. This is what we did. And just to mention a partial result, taking the, the SDG indicators uh, identified as, as possible uh, by, uh, to obtain by Earth observation in, in, the, in one of these geo reports, we saw that it makes perfect sense. Uh, the indicators can be classified in these in these fields, and naturally, uh, most of the the indicators that you can derive from Earth observation are uh, dealing with the state of the of the environment. Next, what we wanted to do is actually to apply this this very same model uh, to to the whole uh, to the to the whole essential variables. Uh, arena. So what we did was was to realize that the, uh, in all the work that has been presented by Anthony before, we can classify the essential variables in two main systems, the earth system and then the socioeconomical system itself. And then what we have uh, is spheres, and each essential variable group uh, affects one particular sphere, and there are spheres that are more mature than others. Atmosphere is mature, biosphere is mature, uh, hydrosphere has started, 
geosphere we don't know any mostly any initiative uh, about that and then we have all these economical uh, essential variables in in the other side that are the ones that allows us also to create indicators uh, to to know exactly the impact in socioeconomic so there, the, the, there are also this 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 model where uh, the essential variables in atmosphere, biosphere, etc., uh, mm, mm, indicates uh, or give us clues on the states and the evolution uh, uh, of the system, but also they provide uh, services. All these first provide services and benefits to to the humanity, but also provide impacts in, in, that are bad uh, for the for the for the humanity. So. So those activities need to change somehow in order to, to, to generate drivers and pressures to the, to the air system again that re, refocus uh, the state and the, and the evolution into the right direction but, and allowing both systems uh, very interconnected to actually work in harmony. So the, this is the general this is the general idea and the, 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 the nice thing here is that we are seeing, different spheres and the uh, ones we have uh, all these fields populated with essential variables we really have all the information to actually analyze the, the whole system and the interactions between the left hand side and the right hand side next so so in essence what is an essential variable uh, it has uh, some characteristics uh, four of them are listed here on one side you need essentiality so you you are dealing with the effectiveness and representativeness of the essential variable also in in, in policy related to the socio-ecological socio system the, you need evolvability so we have a dynamic earth and the essential variables must be able to to evolve to in in a world that that has new problems and require new new answers, but at the same time they need to be consistent through through time. So they should be unambiguous, uh, it, to be useful. Uh, they need a clear description in terms of semantic resolution accuracy. So it's part of the knowledge that 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 we have about the about the system. The feasibility is also a practical characteristic that you need. So measuring the essential variables need to need to be possible and uh, if, and need to be possible not just technically but also economically. So it should have a reasonable cost. Next, what we wanted to to do is is actually to to move this work in the essentials into a. Uh, Geo EV community activity. What uh, we are proposing uh, in in three words is actually to create a community of practice about uh, essential variables. It is not that we want to lead the creation of these of these new essential variables. We really believe that the technologies in the in the spheres themselves, in the in the themes, uh, in the, the the people that are really professionals in in those fields. This is just a meta coordination uh, to to actually detect those gaps, uh, to reduce overlaps, and to uh, engage with the people uh, that might be able to provide these uh, essential variables to complete the definition of the systems that we were talking about before. So it's a convergence effort in defining the the essential variables related with those themes in Earth observation. And uh, of course, we are sensible to this relationship between the essential variables and the policy domain that the sustainable development goals uh, create. Next. We have been talking about uh, several domains where essential variables has been explored in different, uh, in different fields, in different topics. Some of them are more uh, definitely more mature. Some more are exploratory, and you can read them all uh, in in this uh, special issue that that was produced uh, reusing the initial aim of connecting geo and then crystallizing this 
in in geo essentials we definitely recommend um, that you take uh, some some minutes in the sofa to to actually read some some of these uh, documents next we are not the only ones that that produce publications and here you can you can find others uh, related to mineral resources for instance to the land degradation issue to the climate hazard impact uh, on extracting essential variables from remote sensing a classical paper on, on uh, essential biodiversity variables and some other people studying the, fo the focus on sustainable development goals monitoring next so thank you for for your attention this is what we we wanted to transmit and let me reiterate that uh, we encourage you to to actually work with us uh, in the community activity on essential variables that we are uh, pushing into the work uh, program in in geo thank you so thank you anthony and joan um, Simon, Leticia, Gabrielle, and Frank. So we are now ready for our live discussion and question and answer session. So if everybody could please unmute your videos um, and bring up your, um, your smiling faces. Um, I'll start through a list of questions. And we have um, at least 17 questions that I'm seeing right now. So um, I'm going to kick it off fast since we have about 14 minutes. We'll, we'll go 16 minutes because we, we had two minutes that we lost. So the first question, um, essential variables are often designed from the available observations point of view. So how do you consider the user's point of view? And I'm going to direct that question, I guess, to, to Simon or Gabriel, Frank, Leticia. Well, I mean, maybe I could start. I mean, I, I think this is fundamental that they have to be designed around the user's needs. And it's very easy when you get a group of experts together that they look at the observational side of it and what they're interested in. So, I mean, we're trying very hard to actually involve more users uh, in, in, in the definition of the ECVs and try and understand what their needs are. And I think it's important we have to reach out to the different groups that you recognize as likely to use the ECVs. Maybe that's uh, simpler in climate because it's, it's clear who a lot of these groups are and what the uses of the data will be. But I think it's a fundamental thing that you have to think about the users as the primary driver for the defining the variables. Thank you, Simon. Frank? Yeah, I totally agree. This is, uh, I think that there was another question on how the GEO program board can help uh, these different groups within GEO, and this is exactly one of those areas. The, how the scientists that are defining these essential variables can connect to the users in the application. So I, I think that the, it, it is definitely fundamental that the GEO programs that are developing these variables find how these variables really respond to user needs. Leticia, would you like to add anything? Thank you. Yes, well, I think it's it's clear for, for GeoBond as well and in the, the development of the EBVs that the role of users is, is essential, uh, pun intended. Um, and actually, um, historically, the, the the GeoBond was mandated to, to, to do a study on the adequacy of biodiversity observations to inform on the, the IG targets uh, of the CBD. And this is where uh, the, the idea for the EBVs came. So the, the role of the users has been very, uh, very instrumental. What I find also interesting is that by bringing those users on board, and, and by making them understand how those EBVs can be helpful uh, to produce the indicators that they need to track progress towards their targets, we might be able to, at least with the biodiversity part, to encourage more collection of uh, data and the establishment of more uh, biodiversity observation systems. So that's also another argument for, for bringing those users. Gabriel, did you have your hand up too? Uh, yeah, I, I completely agree with the importance of, of 
engaging the users. And I think it's worth noting that to do that very early in the process is important. Um, some users are very data savvy, we know that, but not all users are. So thinking with the users early on about what kind of synthesized and, and maybe interpreted information they can best use in their decision processes or their management activities um, needs to be a priority. Thank you. Okay, I'm gonna go on to the next question. This is a question to Anthony and Juan. Uh, do you feel that the concept of essential variables should be extended to every previously known as societal benefit area of GEO? You know, we're, we're kind of moving towards the engagement priorities. Um, so. yeah, maybe I start and I will let uh, Johan continue. Um, yeah, clearly, it's a kind of the uh, objective of our project, GEO Essential, to explore this and, and, and promote the idea that the, we recognize all the effort of uh, we recognize all the efforts uh, made uh, in the, the uh, existing domains like climate and biodiversity. We see the complexity of uh, of defining uh, these essential variables within one domain, but we also see that we need to clearly bring the data useful to monitor the SDGs. And in order to do that, we need information not only on climate, biodiversity, but clearly also on water, agriculture, and all these other domains. And uh, so uh, if there, in all fields, there is a, um, a lack of means probably to do this monitoring. So if we can uh, be more efficient in, in uh, targeting and, and, um, and, and bringing the necessary data for all domains, uh, we will be able to address uh, each domain, but also the, the bigger picture. Yeah. Uh, Johan, do you have anything to add? Uh, ju just to say that, uh, or to complement that, uh, in uh, geoessentials we are we are using this holistic approach of essential variables. We are analyzing, or we are trying to support as many indicators as possible. This is why we believe uh, that the a uh, comprehensive framework uh, of essential variables could be really, really useful to to elaborate those uh, those indicators. And what we are seeing is that the current framework is incomplete in some sections, and that's why we are defending this this need for for extending the concept uh, and uh, to to some uh, geophysical places and spheres but also to the socioeconomical sphere. All right, uh, next question. Are there any index of achievements to EV monitoring goals? And if so, which EV is best achieved and which is worst and why? Anyone? Yeah. Simon. Well, I mean, I don't know between EVs, but but in in GCOS we look at the ECVs, and we publish a status report every five to ten years, which looks at how well each ECV is being observed, uh, and then that feeds into a process of revising the ECVs and looking at what actions may be needed to improve matters. But when we do that report, for example, the last one, we looked at each ECV and they were uh, coded sort of on a five step scale according to how well we thought they were being observed. But it's difficult to do that in a, um, a consistent, you know, purely uh, quantitative way. It's more of a qualitative assessment, I would guess. I mean, we can look at some things about whether the data is complete globally, whether it um, meets the requirements we've laid down. Is it being used by users to to assess how well it's being observed? So we we try and do it, but it's it, at the end of the day there's a bit of judgment involved um, to actually say how well they're being observed, and it does vary very much from ECV to ECV. And some areas there are problems with reporting, others with coverage. Obviously, there are differences between things that can be observed from satellites tend to be pretty complete in there. 
whereas some of the ground-based stuff can be more mixed. But anyway, so that's the approach we've taken, and uh, it does give a good guide, I think, to where we are with the observing system and enables you to focus your attention on what needs to be improved. Thank you, Simon. Okay. Move on to the next question, and this is to Letitia, um, Gabrielle, and Frank. Oh, sorry. I see hands up. Frank? Well, just to follow up on that, I, I think that the standard that the ECV has been, uh, has established through GCOS has been very, very good. And the fact that they have been open to the integration of other types of variables to become part of that standard is very good. So we have seen a migration of uh, variables that were initially, for example, uh, uh, defined by the Global, Global Ocean Observing System, slowly migrating into the ECVs because they have some of the, these characteristics. And so now you have ECVs that have a biological components. And so slowly we're coming to what I think is a successful framework that is recognizing that it is not just the physics that matters to people, but uh, other aspects that are part of how you, you measure climate, and that includes biology. So I, I think that there's a success in how we're developing the framework itself, and many people are using it even unconsciously on uh, how do you look at the uh, water quality of the ocean using some of these ECVs. They may not call it an ECV or an EOV or an EBV, but they're using the observations. Uh, Leticia, did you have your hand up too? Well, I can just very briefly answer that this this is a very good question, and this is one of the questions that uh, Forrest started this EBV 2020 initiative that I mentioned. So the first step is already to um, identify which are the data products out there and how they how well the different EBV classes and EBVs are, are covered by those data products. So I cannot answer this question yet, but hopefully uh, very shortly. All right, uh, next question. Um, do, do essential variables capture drivers or processes of change or both? I I don't think they should. Uh, I mean, they they capture the status and eventually the evolution if you have a time series uh, of the system. Uh, so that that why that's why the the whole model uh, on drivers, pressures, uh, impact, response, and 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 so on was uh, was really interesting for for us to because classifying the indicators in the SDGs. On those boxes, you immediately see which ones make sense, uh, or in which ones it makes sense to try and apply the the essential variables in the first place. Uh, in my opinion, the, this is the role of the scientific research and the model and, and the modeling uh, efforts to determine which are the drivers and the influences and the pressures and so on. And this is actually the acknowledge that we need to take the informed decisions. So essential variables is the first. Uh, the, the the first input that we need for for those models. The models are kind of the engine that they simulate the the engine of of the of the evolution and the essential variables are actually the fuel uh, that you need to to actually run the engine and and get that knowledge back. Frank, I, I would say that they do uh, if. If and in many cases, one essential variable is a driver for another essential variable. And so I, I think, for example, if you have many of the biological processes like productivity, which is in, in, in some of these variable framework, productivity of, uh, of vegetation or productivity of life is a variable, that's very much driven, for example, by temperature or water availability. So I think that they are... Uh, if you think about some drivers are in many ways uh, part of the framework and the processes, they're not all covered, 
but I think some processes that are essential are included. Atisha, did you have your hand up? Frank said it better than I would have, so. Okay, great. Um, all right, so noting that it's, um, our, our session time has expired. Um, we have uh, 16 more questions to get through. We have a number of questions. So unfortunately, we're not going to get to them during our live session, uh, but we will respond to all the questions um, over the next week. Uh, and Slido will remain open for another 48 hours, which just happens to be the weekend. So if everybody wants to work on the weekend, you're more than welcome to submit questions on Slido. Um, so I would like to uh, just summarize the session today was focused on existing essential variables and the proposal that communities should engage with groups that could help define and extend the existing EV frameworks. To review the frameworks, the definitions of each EV, um, to, develop, to develop proposals to extend the frameworks and establish a vetting process. Um, the communities need to come together to help to populate, review, and endorse the EV definitions, review the methods, and standards that could be placed into existing practical best practices repositories. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank all of the panelists and presenters um, during this session um, to your contributions to the symposium and to GEO. And I do want to take this opportunity to also thank Rick and Wenbo for their outstanding, exceptional support. Uh, this symposium would not have without them, so thank you.